So, hey everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Beth Potter, and along with Layla, um, one of the co-organizers for this lecture series, Explorations in Archaeology. So, before we do get started, just a reminder to please keep your microphones muted and submit questions via the chat function. We'll read those at the end of the talk, and then we'll move into a more standard open question and answer session. So I'm really excited today to introduce one of our colleagues here at KU in the anthropology department, Justin Garnett. Justin is a PhD student in archeology span and he uses experimental and experiential methods to study projectile technology. He's a highly skilled flint napper and has even created replicas of tools and projectiles for museums. So with that, um, we're really excited to welcome Justin Garnett. Justin. Hello. Um, so presumably, presumably everyone can hear me. Um, hi, thanks for the thanks for the great introduction. I, um, I don't consider myself a highly skilled flint napper. I consider myself to muddle. I consider myself to muddle through competently. Um, so what I'm going to be talking to you guys um, about tonight is going to be um, some experiments which um, I've done with a lot of help from a good friend of mine, um, Devin Pettigrew, who's currently at the um, University of Boulder or University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, when you do stuff like this, um, these combat experiments, you sort of need, you kind of need combatants. So, um, you know, hence uh, always, always work with other people. Um, let me go ahead and pull up my, pull up my screen here so that I can get started. Um, I've got share screen, got that, got that, all right. So um, Beth or Layla, is that, is that up on the screen right now? Okay, awesome. So <clears throat> I'm gonna be talking about experiments with allotles as combat weapons, and I'll kind of get into why I'm specifying as combat weapons um, a, little bit, a little bit further in and, and really what that, what that means. Um, but for now, doing experiments with allotles. So first, I'm going to acknowledge that I'm, I probably don't know how to use PowerPoint to its fullest, and I'm probably going to botch something um, at some point along along this um, presentation. So just uh, just bear with me and be be sensitive. Um, I'm learning. So first off, I want to go with a, a land statement, and I made it large so that everybody would be able to see it. Um, I recognize that the University of Kansas is located on land from which the indigenous and rightful owners have been forcibly removed by the genocidal campaigns of the United States. These include, but are not limited to the, the Ka Osage and Shawnee. So why look at atlatls um, in the context of combat? I mean, there's a lot of modern, <clears throat> there's a lot of modern interest um, in atlatls in, um, in the sporting realm. Um, there's a lot of people um, lobbying, campaigning to use these um, weapons as um, as uh, hunting weapons um, in a lot of in a lot of states. Um, but I think what's kind of what's kind of important is um, to remember that in addition to being hunting implements, they are also weapons utilized in human in um, human combat. And what that really what that really means is that you can't understand the transition between between technologies. You can't understand why people would shift from, say, lances to bottle darts to bows and arrows by only looking at one aspect of what that technology is used for. Um, you kind of have to holistically <clears throat> holistically look at things. So what we have here is a, a picture of some moche. Um, Moche uh, elites hunting um, hunting deer, and you can learn a lot from this kind of from this kind of imagery. This came off of a <clears throat> came off of a piece of ceramic that uh, shows drivers um, driving deer with nets um, and sticks to waiting elites in extremely fancy costumes. So we can see that these things are important for like worldview and identity building um, in indigenous societies. So really the reason why, we, why we'd be interested in looking at this is because we need to understand these transitions. So archery is already relatively well understood. Um, we have really good European records of combat dynamics and the way that we, that we Europeans um, used them. We have a lot of historical sources, um, lots of ethnographic sources, lots of artifacts. Um, we have longbow societies um, in 
Britain since the 19th century, um, since the revival, the most recent revival of, um, of archery. Um, <clears throat> and it's part of our collective Western tradition from the Western perspective, um, which is where a lot of anthropology you know, has its roots and comes from. It's differentially valued because it's our history rather than the history of, a, of an ethnographic, ethnographic other. So New World at Lottles, less so. Um, we don't really have a lot of good records. Um, there's not a lot of um, ethnographic sources. Um, a lot of documents, uh, pre-Columbian pre documents um, from Mesoamerica were actively destroyed by the um, actions of the um, Spanish um, colonists. Um, so traditions were just basically crushed and the ability to transfer information was um, curtailed um, greatly. And so there's a lot of persistent myths about Atlatls, like related in the popular culture and in, um, in archaeology in general. We seem to think that they're a lot more powerful than they are, like that they are just these, you know, just super potent weapons that you can just use to just slaughter any huge animal, you know, without a lot of effort. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of approach some more of those, uh, some more of those questions. But like any technology, this isn't really, you know, you can't really make generalizations. So we have to look at the idea of forgotten technologies. And so the biggest, one of the biggest myths associated with models is that they've been forgotten. Um, they haven't. The question is, who have they been forgotten by? And they have been forgotten by the Western world. Um, I have pictures here from the spanning the 20th century of um, Mexican um, individuals. Um, these are Tarascans. Um, you can see Lake Pazcuaro um, in the upper right. Uh, that's the 1950s. They were still being, outlaws were still being used by canoe, um, uh, canoe riding um, outlawists who would go out on the lake and throw, um, throw these darts at individual, um, at like clouds of ducks as they would take off off the lake. Um, and they would throw these long three barbed um, outlaw darts through the, through the cloud of, uh, of birds and then retrieve them um, as they floated on the on the lake afterward. And you can see an identical, um, in the lower right, you can see an identical atlatl um, in the hands of a um, Tarascan today. <clears throat> so perhaps the most dangerous myth associated with these technologies is that of the vanished Indian, you know, which is the idea that these technologies have been lost and the people who used them are also lost and that there is no way that we can, you know, learn anything um, indigenously. <clears throat> but that, I mean, that's not entirely true. There are places where these things are actually still in use. Um, the gentleman in the picture here um, is in the Zingu Basin in, um, in uh, Brazil. And uh, they have an annual, there's an annual um, combat simulation there called the Juari, um, in which mock combat is performed um, with these lottles and darts. Um, you can see on the ends of the, of the darts, there are lumps, black, um, lumps. Those are actually um, molded rubber, um, which is like molded onto the ends of the um, onto the ends of the darts. And you know, of course, that's going to hurt a lot. You know, if you get hit by something like that, because that's you know, it's just a hard hard lump of um, of material. But these are basically used in the context of a ritualized um, combat. Um, I don't want to call it a sport, but a, a ritualized um, combat. And they're also still used in other parts in other parts of the New World. Uh, here's a here's a fellow who has uh, actually outlawed a whale, uh, which is pretty pretty gosh darn impressive um, if you if you ask me. So there's there's stuff to be learned there. <clears throat> so if we get back into how outlawls were used as weapons. Um, we need to know what their limitations are. So the reason for this is as I kind of already as I already mentioned, we have to understand what the differences are between different technology systems. They're not always equivalent, even when they seem to serve equivalent um, functions. So understanding how weapon systems like bows and arrows differ in terms of, um, of dynamics can help you understand uh, the social pressures and um, the needs that people would have um, when they use them in their lives. So it'll basically help you come up with more meaningful models of, um, of technological um, replacement. So as I mentioned, we're, we, are getting, we are getting a better understanding of um, how models are used in sport, but again, not in combat. Here's um, <clears throat> the World Model Association 
I, I have to I have to tip my hat to them. They're a um, a lot of um, they're an a lot of um, sporting organization. I'm in the United States. They've been around since the 1980s, and um, a lot of their members are active hunters, and um, they do a lot of promotion of these weapons with the public. This is um, a Missouri uh, Missouri member, um, Don Wagner, who is the first woman to have killed a deer with an allotl in um, recorded modern um, modern history. Um, so this is part of the ongoing natural experiment that we're doing to kind of figure out, you know, what society how society is testing what these weapons are good for, you know, and what they, you know, what their limitations are is through actual use in the field by um, by hobbyists and um, and others. So I myself do a lot of um, fishing with these. Um, so you can see a, a carp I caught this summer um, and my my gear. So now we're going to get back down into actual actual combat stuff. So experimenting is a great way to help you understand things. You know, it it beats doing beats thinking. So the human body learns through practice, and we can start with a couple of um, with a couple of premises, which is the human body is the same today as it has been in the past. Western bodies are fundamentally the same as indigenous, although we have a different habitus. So we build up a different way of being through our habitual, our habitual actions over the course of our lives. And I think the, re the reason why it's important to, to point this out is you can, with the leverage systems of your body, approximate the same kinds of situations which people were creating technologies to address in the past. So through using tools, you gain an insight into what they are, you know, what they are used for and um, what they, you know, what drivers may have existed to, to create them. So another, another important aspect is all models are the same today as in the past. The technology is, is the same, it is still functionally the same. And what that means is that with our, same body with our same mind and with our same technology we should be able to recreate combat situations um, and sort of get an idea of how these things would be would actually be used so i have a, a quite a few videos that i'm gonna that i'm gonna show you guys um, and i think something to to bear in mind is that we don't have any training at this this is the kind of stuff which you just kind of pick up and you're like i'm gonna test this out so in um, in this video, we're throwing at um, I believe these ones are at fifteen at fifteen yards um, with bottles and darts that are replicas of um, of equipment from the artifact equipment from the American Southwest. Um, we'll go ahead and get this one going. And so in this, in this video, um, we're lobbing darts back and forth between each other. Those who have been throwing a lot for well over 10 years at the time that this video was made. And yet the lot darts are so slow in flight that we are able to step out of the way of them um, as, they, as they approach um, at a reasonably short range. Um, we're not far apart. Um, 15, 15 yards isn't a, isn't a long distance. But what you, what you see is that the darts move slowly. They, their speed tends to max out um, at somewhere around 80 miles per hour with most uh, lottle darts traveling more around, um, around 50, um, somewhere in that, in that ballpark. So, Another another thing which we have which we learned through our experiments is that when you directly compare an allotl and a bow, people who are shooting allotls or bows um, for speed, um, there's barely a difference between how fast um, how fast you can shoot darts from an allotl throw throw darts with an allotl from how quickly you can um, shoot them with a bow. 
Um, so this kind of indicates that the speed of shooting, like the rapidity of getting projectiles in the air, I mean, that just doesn't really seem to be a, you know, big driver on, you know, a switch between these, um, between these technologies. So that was an interesting, an interesting, um, interesting outcome. So for the rest of these experiments, we're going to be talking about um, hits to the body. So I consider hits to the red area of the, uh, of the body um, in my picture over here to be on target hits. Those are the best hits. Those are the ones that you want for, you know, incapacitating um, quickly through bleeding, um, that kind of thing. Um, and <clears throat> hits to the, um, let's see, is there a way for me to shift? Yes, okay. Do, 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 do. Where am I going to stick this? Okay, so we'll we'll do that. So um, in terms of the experiments which I did, which was a, a number of these, quite a, quite a number of these um, experiments, um, at ten yards, the most common outcome um, of engagement with uh, engagements with the models were either dodges or misses. Um, in terms of hits. Um, of which there was only, I mean, there was considerably, considerably fewer. Um, most of the hits wound up being, um, wound up being to the body, but it was an extraordinarily low number of hits relative to, relative to the number of throws. <clears throat> so this is, a, this is one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite videos. Um, this was, <laughs> this is, this is great. So. <laughs> Anyway, this, uh, this video is an attempted run on an otlotalist by a, a person unarmed with um, an otlotl. So I have a club um, over here, which is made from cattail leaves, so it will not cause injury. <laughs> so, the thing that the thing that I that I love about this is I'm not even like a good dodger, right? Like I mean, I'm not even I don't even look good doing it. It's like I I look terrible. It's awkward. I clearly don't know what I'm doing, but I successfully evade being hit by three by three outlawed cards. <laughs> so I really I really enjoyed that one. Um, so when you actually look at this across the experiments. Um, in terms of these engagements with um, with a club wielder, um, the chance that you're going to hit the person running on you goes up dramatically the closer the closer they get to you. You can you can see that, but it's still it's still not a good um, not a good ratio. And by the time that 15 yard um, or um, 10 yard um, distance is closed. The black bar is how often you actually receive a fa what would be basically a fatal injury from getting hit by that club. So it's like once the distance is closed, you've got a person directly on top of you with a weapon and you're stabbing, you know, the, the stabbing of the uh, lottle dart isn't actually going to take them out of the fight because these things kill by exsanguination. You, you die from bleeding. There's no concussion. There's no, there's no effect that takes you out of the fight. So in all of these cases, the person doing the throwing probably was also going to receive an injury um, in the course of this um, in the course of this altercation. So I want to talk now about fending sticks. So fending sticks are interesting artifacts that come from um, the American Southwest. Um, they are generally about two feet long. They're also called grooved clubs. And there are a number of authors who have over the course of the last hundred years, um, I think 1914 was the earliest recording of this, um, of this theory, have floated the idea that the purpose of these double curved sticks is to send otlottle darts out of the air as they come flying at you. Um, Alfred Vincent Kidder is the first person who overtly stated this um, that I'm aware of. And, um, a number of other prominent um, archaeologists have um, brought this up over over years over the years. So 
it's been in the literature for like 100 years and it gets repeated quite a bit. So the question is, well, what happens when you actually try to fend darts with a fending stick? Um, so let's find out. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this and then you'll see what happens and then I'll kind of explain it afterward. But these were, these were fun, fun experiments. We did this over and over and over again. So that's about as close to what you would consider a successful fend. Earl Morris um, basically said that this um, would have been highly efficacious in striking aside slow moving outlottle darts. And he definitely had the slow moving part right. I mean, you can see the outlottle darts coming in flight much better than you can an arrow, for instance. But you can see where I touch my arm. Um, our convention was that every time we actually received a hit or felt it on our body, we would touch the part of our body where we had been hit so that, you know, when you go back and did the analysis of the video, if it wasn't immediately apparent what happened, you would know for sure that somebody got touched. So in this case, I, I wouldn't have been injured, but I was, you know, I was grazed by that shaft as it went by. So here's another one. And so I hope what you what you saw in this is that in both cases where I where I and where um, Devin here swept the dart aside, they were not actually going to hit us. They were actually very close to us. They were on trajectories which were right next to us, but they actually didn't pose a threat to us. So let's go ahead and jump to another one. I think this might actually, yeah, here we go. This happened a lot. Um, a lot of the time, the act of standing still as the darts come in to try to see where it's, you know, you, have, you basically have to stand still in order to see where the dart's coming um, and in order to focus on it and knock it and knock it aside. Um, the act of standing still right there makes those darts hit you, you know? <laughs> because as we saw in, in the earlier experiments, you can just jump out of the way of these things. Like as you see them coming at you, you can just flinch out of the way of them. So in these experiments, basically the most common thing that happened when you tried to fend was you got hurt. You would receive an injury um, and frequently those injuries would be like, in your um, in your arms because that's the forward facing part of your body that's like you know that you're like holding out in front of that um, in front of that incoming dart, um, but a lot of them wind up being hits to your body. Like I mean, you're looking at like hits to the thorax, like the big blood pumping, you know, air pumping organs um, would wind up would wind up getting hit. Um, and what's interesting is that on this um, on this graph of outcomes, um, dodge is on there. Well. We didn't try to dodge. We just instinctively flinched sometimes when the dart came, when the dart came flying at us. And our instinctive flinching provided greater protection than the fending stick. But what we also discovered was that shields are great for blocking darts. So shields are, you know an object which are like demonstrably, and you can you can prove they are literally designed for the express purpose of blocking objects. You have to kind of use your imagination to see how a curved stick could be intended to be a tool for blocking, you know, for blocking um, incoming projectiles. But shields, that's just, that's just what they're for. We used small shields um, for these experiments. Uh, they were 14 inches in diameter, uh, which was loosely based on um, archery bucklers um, or um, yeah, from the, uh, European uh, Middle Ages, um, and then also also based on um, codex drawings uh, from from um, Central America. Um, a lot of a lot of um, Aztec um, codices show people with small you know with small shields um, on one arm, usually three darts in a hand, um, engaging in some form of of a lot of um, 
activity. So these are my favorite videos. And so, I mean, without any kind of, without any kind of training, I'll go ahead and run that again. Um, you know, without any kind of training, um, we were able to block almost all the darts which people threw at us um, with small diameter shields. And so the reason is because your eye is able to see the outlottle dart as it, as it comes in, even without those big heads on. Um, our, first, our first padded heads were considerably smaller than that, but they, they wound up hurting too much. So we wound up, uh, we wound up um, going to these, to these larger ones. But the shape of the outlottle dart is it comes flying in at you. You're able to easily tell where it's, where it's actually going to impact with enough resolution that you can move your arm, you know, because I mean, that's a 14 inch across object that you're moving up there. That can basically cover, it covers all of your critical organs. So when you see that a dart is coming in at your body, all you have to do, you don't even have to worry about like, matching it perfectly. You just get it up there in front of your body and that dart will bounce off if it was coming toward your, you know, toward your um, organs. Um, I think the thing that's, I think that's important to note here is that for safety, we used darts which were, um, we used darts which were padded um, and we used, um, you know, baseball chest protectors and, um, and masks, which we tested by throwing um, darts at to make sure that darts would not penetrate them. So we, we did our, our due diligence on trying to, you know, avoid, <laughs> on trying to avoid um, serious injury. But yeah, um, we, did, we, did, we did the best, we did the best we could. But I mean, if you do stuff like this, um, damage to gear um, is a very real possibility. You had to inspect this gear constantly to make sure it didn't get, you know, get, make sure it didn't get hurt. Because if a head breaks off, the shaft is dangerous. You know, you've got sharp, you've got sharp wood, which could cause some injury. So what I'm really getting at here is, don't run out and get yourself a baseball protector and start a league. Um, as much fun, <laughs> as much fun as it looks like it is, um, it is, um, it is not comfortable. Those are hitting us with enough force to outright. I mean, to the recommended um, kinetic energy and momentum for deer hunting. Um, so you don't want to, you don't want to do this a lot. So the point, the point that I was, that I was basically, um, that I was kind of getting at, um, well, I, lo I lose my trains of, I lose my trains of thought uh, frequently, but basically in terms of these, um, in terms of these combat situations, um, I just got hit, I just got hit in the body. Um, but the, the thing, the thing about those impacts, I should have, I should have actually like edited this so you could see it happen over and over again. The thing about it is because we have these padding, we have these padded heads on our darts and the outer layer of our shields is, um, is padded as well. It's basically designed to minimize, minimize the concussion and the impact. So when you get hit, when you see the hits, those darts, you know, they bounce off. Um, I mean, in real life, those would be sharp and they would be sticking in those, you know, they would be sticking in the shields. I mean, they're not super heavy. So it's not like, I mean, each dart only weighs, you know, a few ounces. So it's not like you're gonna be bristling with these things and it's gonna weigh you down like, um, you know, Roman javelins. But I mean, you're, when you block these things, there's a very real possibility that depending on the material of the shield, um, you might actually wind up with um, points coming through um, and still causing injury to your arms. Um, but, you know, the chance of, of that injury um, being fatal would be just astronomically less than in the case of, um, of using the, the fending stick. So let me go ahead and shift this over to the side again. So what does all of this mean? Um, I don't claim to be an amazing outlottle warrior. I don't claim that I have like any skill at doing this. I, am, I was competent enough for the experiments um, which we did. And 
we, I was able to avoid injury in a lot of cases. In our best strings, and I didn't put these on because they were like painful to watch, in our best strings of um, blocking with, uh, with the shields, there would be like 30. You'd be able to block 30 times before you finally slipped up. Um, so we had like 30 successful fins before, you know, before somebody would actually get hit in the body. So the shields are very, are very effective in, um, in a lot of combat. So basically, we need more experiments, um, and we need more practice. We need we need to build habitus. We need to build better, you know, body awareness in order to in order to do this sort of thing. Um, but I mean, at least doing this, we can make a few general general statements about um, about level combat, um, and kind of use this to inform you know better questions about the level to bow transition. Um, you can definitely see that there are some limitations of the level and dart as a weapon relative to a, to the bow and arrow. Um, that projectile velocity is so low that, though, that they are easy to block, even though they do inflict serious injuries when they get to their targets, um, they, are, they are slow um, and easy to see in flight. Um, so projectile velocity is really the difference. Um, accuracy doesn't really seem to be the difference because we have there's a lot of highly skilled atlatlists who put a lot of time in on this. And although it's harder to learn, although the learning curve is, is sharper, um, they're able to get really impressive, impressive accuracy. Um, so what else am I working on? Well, I'm, I'm working on all sorts of things, but one of my, one of my projects um, is a atlatl throwing robot um, for controlled controlled ballistic experiments. And I'm also working on um, replicating points, um, replicating specific tools in, um, in porcelain, um, which I hope will be useful for, um, which I hope will be useful um, for controlled experiments. Uh, whoops, that wasn't what I meant to do. So thanks for listening. Um, I hate to, hate to not really have a strong conclusion. You know, I, I, I hate to be like, I don't have the answer. I don't know. I don't know what would drive the change from uh, an atlatl or from an atlatl to a bow. But I just hope to have drawn a little bit of attention to the fact that we need to do experiments in order to, you know, get at those in order to get at those questions because they are askable questions. You know, we just need to be able to do enough um, to build up enough skill uh, and a varied enough skill set to um, really to really address them. So without any further ado on that, I'm going to go ahead and unshare, stop share. All righty. And I see there are some questions. But as I say, I, I'm opening this up, um, opening this up for questions. So we have, I have one question that I got. Have you looked at the ethnographic record of warfare in Australia? Yes, um, I, I have, um, not, in as much, um, not in as much detail um, as I need to, but I've even seen, um, I've even seen pop culture um, references to a lot of dueling um, in uh, films such as 10 Canoes, um, but, yeah, this is definitely something which um, this is definitely something which um, we can explore um, through Australian Aboriginal um, records. Most of what I'm familiar with um, with with um, Australia is um, accuracy, um, like accounts of um, you know people putting hats on sticks and you know throwing at them at, at great distances. Um, and that sort of stuff. But insofar as actual um, combat, I'm not, I'm not familiar. And we have another question. What does it mean for understanding the transition to bow and arrow? Are bows better for warfare? Well, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna say that, right? I mean, that's the question of the question of better, you know, it, it comes down to the circumstances um, around you. I think that, I mean, if you really, if you really had to, to press me on it, I would say that, I mean, I would rather have a bow um, than an atlatl if I were having to, having to do combat. But I think that there are some, I think that there are some 
differences between the systems um, which come across in warfare, which don't come across in hunting. For instance, ammunition capacity, um, people frequently think about in terms of this transition, but that's not actually critical for hunting. I mean, ethnographically, people who hunt don't do so with large numbers, um, large numbers of arrows. So they're not maxing out their arrow capacity in order to, in order to hunt. They're getting very close to, um, they're getting very close to their prey. Um, they're making those shots, they're making those shots count, um, things like that. Whereas in, in combat, you actually do want lots and lots of projectiles um, in order to be able to, you know, keep, you know, keep shooting at, at people who are shooting back at you. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think, yes, I think the, I think the answer is that the bow does seem to be better suited to human conflict. That would be my, my general, my general statement, but I think I'd deny it if you, uh, if you pressed me on it. Oh, we have another have another question here. Um, okay, I'm sorry for a graphic question, but have you been? But I, I am about to ask: Have you been able to gauge how far an outlawed or dart would penetrate the body? Um, I realize that it's very sharp, and the more accurate you, of the throw, the deeper you know, the the more fatal. Um, but if the weapon were to hit the side of your torso, um, would it stick there? Um, the answer is yes. A friend of mine, um, Devin Pettigrew, who is in the videos with me, um, he just th did an experiment where he threw um, these same darts, darts that weigh exactly the same amount as, um, as these ones with stone points on them, um, pretty much mostly through a bison torso. So, I mean, <laughs> they do some pretty, they do some pretty substantial, um, pretty substantial damage. The actual momentum um, and kinetic energy um, of, these, of these darts is basically um, right at the recommended, it's between the recommended threshold for um, medium game and big game um, for big game hunting. So yeah, you would, I mean, it would stick in you, it would put you in a world of hurt, yeah. Can I ask a follow-up? Is that comparable to what you'd see with a bow and arrow? I mean, it depends, right? I mean, so bows and arrows are extremely, extremely variable, but the place where I got my, where I got my figures were recommendations for bow hunters. Um, so, I mean, yeah, basically. The thing is, arrows being smaller and lighter, they take up a greater portion of their, of their killing force comes from the kinetic energy rather than the momentum. So heavier objects have more momentum and less kinetic energy, you know, uh, so you have to kind of balance those two. So they don't directly, you can't directly compare big heavy projectiles like hot lottles, I mean like a lot of darts to smaller projectiles like, um, like bows and arrows. But you also have to take into consideration, you know, the differences in um, the weight, you know, the difference in, uh, uh, or the difference in draw weight. So like a bow can have anywhere, a functional hunting bow can have anywhere from like 25 to 35 pounds of, of draw force all the way up to like 80 to 150. You know, I mean, you can, there's like a lot of variability um, in terms of what a bow, um, in terms of what output a bow can do. Yeah, you mentioned building habitus. What what people or groups exist that may already have that habitus that could be a part of this research? And that's a great that's a great question. Um, I had I had um, a couple a couple of examples um, in my in my presentation. Um, the so uh, in the Zingu Basin, um, there's a group called the Quikru, um who still do this Juari festival. There's a, there's a number of groups that that come together there. But presumably, um, presumably they would be good collaborators um, for something for something like this. Um, yeah, insofar as um, as 
indigenous users of, um, of these weapons. Um, Papua New Guinea might also potentially have some sources, um, but I mean, we also have to have to put the caveat on here that we're actually looking at using these things in terms of combat, whereas you know in in those areas they're they're using them more in a ritualized like ritualized combat. Um, I don't know of any instances in the world right now where they're presently being used like for actual like human on human violence. If that, I mean, if that's a meaningful distinction. I don't know if you saw, but there was a bit of a follow-up to that. Should we be building that habitus for the sake of this experimental stuff? Oh, should we? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I feel like as long as, I feel like it's exploring useful, it's exploring useful questions um, in ways that can only further our, further our understanding. Um, so I think, I mean, I personally obviously feel like we should be building this because I mean, I did these experiments, right? I mean, it's like, I think that it is a good, a good thing. Now, if, if you said to me, should we be trying to promote models as weapons for combat? I would say absolutely not. It's like, no, we shouldn't be engaging in violence with each other. That's awful. Um, but I think that these, I think that these are, are useful questions to explore because as long as we as long as we make determinations about technological shifts without fully exploring them, we're going to come up with um, kind of shoddy, you know, or, or incomplete answers. And then uh, another question. When you mentioned those S-shaped sticks, the fending sticks, did you, do you have any idea what their function actually is? Based on what you saw, yeah. So um, they they're basically boomerangs. They, I mean, they, they look they look like boomerangs. Um, I yes, I would I feel safe in in making a statement that they're most likely boomerangs. Um, the kind of damage which um, has like the kind of use wear which has been seen on them, um, like cactus spikes being embedded in them and that kind of stuff, is pretty consistent with uh, ethnographic rabbit sticks. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is, I think that that is what they are. Um, then we have a question here, which is, is the atlatl more effective than a spear? Um, so, I mean, this is a good question. It's a deceptively, you know, a deceptively complicated question because just like the, you know, just like the question of, well, what's a bow? You know, there's all kinds of different bows. There's all kinds of atlatls. There's all kinds of spears. Uh, but generally speaking, an atlatl allows you to throw a lighter projectile at a higher velocity. Whereas a spear, you can throw a big heavy projectile at a lower velocity. So your ultimate, the ultimate kinetic energy and momentum that they carry, I mean, they can be very similar. Um, and the damage, you know, the, the distance that it's possible to throw javelins um, winds up being similar to the distance that you can actually throw atlatl darts. Um, their maximum ranges um, cross over. So it depends on what you're trying to do, really. I mean, the atlatl is more effective if what you're trying to do is, for instance, persistence hunt over a long distance. Like if I'm traveling a long distance overland, I can carry five darts or three darts, um, whereas I couldn't probably carry, I couldn't carry like more than one or two big heavy javelins that would do the same, you know, the same ultimate killing um, at the end but my life would be easier, you know, the way it fits into my particular life way. So, yeah, I mean, it really, I mean, it really depends on what you're, you know, what you're, what you're planning on getting out of it. Um, so I, I really kind of shy away from giving statements as to like, the atlatl is more effective or is not, because you also have to take into consideration that an aspect of the technology is how serviceable it is and how um, much time you're putting in on making it. And you know you can definitely make effective spears easier than you can make effective models. So if you take you know if you take that into the equation, I mean there's a whole set of kind of hidden um, advantages or, or differences between the two. We had one more question as well. Would certain types of tips be more efficient in warfare as opposed to hunting? And if so, what do they look like? 
Yeah, so that's a really big that's a really big question, and there's a lot of people there's a lot of people asking questions related to that. Um, there are there are some who think that obsidian points in general are better suited to warfare than other forms of stone. Um, there are definitely purpose made points which um, are intended to be used against people which um, have barbs um, like you know backward facing barbs um, so that they embed or break off. Um, in the body. Um, but I mean, there's so many ways to do the same jobs that I think generally, you know, generally it would be difficult to make a, you know, to make a, a call on that. Um, although we definitely do know that in some societies they did have different projectiles for war and for, and for hunting. Um, but I can't make a, a generalization as to what that difference would look like. A good, a good example of actually that I can think of um, is there are a lot of um, wooden points in the American Southwest, which we, you know, you wouldn't look at it as being terribly effective. You'd be like, what's the deal with this wooden point? This isn't a great idea. Yet they've been found embedded in human pelvises or through the faces of, um, of mummies. So, I mean, clearly, at least sometimes they were being used um, against other human beings. But I mean, it doesn't seem like they would be the logical choice that you would you know, that you would necessarily make. So I think we got to everything in the chat. Um, if anybody has any other questions you have for Justin, I mean, feel free to unmute and ask them now. We're, we're good. And if not, I think we can wrap up. Thank you so much, Justin. That was awesome. Yep. It was really interesting. All right. Thanks a lot. It was good. Good talking to everybody. Thank you. And we'll see you guys all hopefully in two weeks for Brian Weigel's talk on archaeology in Beringia. Thanks, everyone.